Founded in 1999 by Jason Burks, Retrospect Films is Oklahoma's largest turnkey production company of its kind. With over two decades of experience, a full-time team of over 20 talented individuals, a 12,000 square foot studio to create in, and thousands of successfully completed projects in both entertainment and advertising. You're in the right place if you like hearing some good old filmmaking stories. On this podcast, we will discuss the pursuit of creating things and the problems we solve by digging up projects from across the last 20 years and giving you a glimpse behind the scenes where the magic happens. You're listening to Retrospect Films from the Archives. Okay. You look good. We going? Yep, we're ready. All right, here we go. Hello and welcome, and thanks for joining us on Retrospect from the Archives, where we are... All right. Here we go. Uh. Hello, and thanks for joining us on Retrospect from the Archives, where we discuss the pursuit of creating things and the problems we solve in that process. Joining me today, we have Josh Tackett on my right, and then we have Chris Diamond. Hello. Uh, How do you introduce yourself usually? Hi, my name is Chris Diamond. I'm six foot two, and I work... Oh, wait, no, that's like my (laughs) acting slate. That's, That's fine. That's good. Is that how you introduce yourself when you like? I just say I'm Chris Diamond. Okay, there we go. Chris Diamond, the Chris Diamond. Today, we are excited to talk about a very unique project that we did for the Quapaw Tribe in 2022. Uh, And this was a um, ambitious project from my perspective. When uh, I first started talking with the people over at Downstream Casino, and they said, we would like to do something that is full animation. And we, I mean, obviously anything complicated in the visual storytelling world, we enjoy to take on, but I'm also uh, hesitant to say yes to things I'm not sure if we can do. When we first started dabbling in this idea, I had extensive conversations with them. They had a huge event coming up in the, in the summer that they wanted to make a promotional piece for that was about a minute long. Yeah, a minute and a half or About a minute and a half, something like that. And so the first thing I said was, okay, stand by. Let me talk to these two guys and see what they're thinking. So so we sat down and started doing a little bit of discovery on what do we actually think that we can do. You know, we have done a decent amount of animation, but many times it's for like two seconds or for like five seconds, or it's very specifically stylistic. You know, when you look at movies like, I don't know, Toy Story, and you have a team of 350 people working on it for two and a half years, uh, you can create some great stuff. But here, when you have like two to three people working on it for a month and a half, uh, I mean, that could translate into three seconds of photorealistic, amazing animation. So we were aiming at 90 seconds. Um, So I think I want to kind of hand it off from there, and we can take it down the road. Let's... uh, Let's see, why don't we start with you, Tackett? I think, you know, just with your position being post-production director um, and having been here the longest, worked on a lot of animation projects over the years, I do remember coming to you and saying, okay, let's sit down with Chris and talk about what can be done. Uh, give me give me kind of that story from your perspective and what the task was ahead of us. Yeah, I think, you know, with us not taking on 3D animation all the time, constantly, and not being our main thing we do, that was like the question is like, okay, can we handle this? Can we take this on? And Chris over here, though, has been spending all of his time in 3D as of late, I don't know, the last two years or so. I just How would you point say? Out, you said animation when you first intro this. This is like they wanted not a 2D or like a flip book or like hand drawn. This is mm-hmm. completely 3D, the, the third dimension environment. Yeah. So. yeah. Yeah, actually. And if it was a 2D animation, we, it would be like a different person in a different department yep. altogether. But yep. Maddie, yeah. with Chris, you know, I I knew what Chris's capabilities were, and I was like, I think we can handle this. I can help him a little bit, but this is kind of mainly his area. Mm-hmm. And so we kind of pretty much started out with, okay, let's look for a look. Let's make a storyboard, see if we think, you know, what would happen over the course of this time, and then we can know what do we actually need to create. Mm-hmm. And we kind of figured out that it was – the whole concept was centered around these different animals that have significant meanings to their tribe. Yeah. And um, so we immediately knew, okay, we got to have animals that we bring to life mm-hmm. in animation and we got to put them in all these different environments and we got to have seamless transitions. And I think we ended up going with, instead of like a one shot, we ended up going with cuts because mm-hmm. it just ended up being, um, just made more sense. Yeah. But 
um, yeah, that's kind of where we started our head. So we, I mean, right at, right off the bat, you started looking online for different models and things like that. I mean, you might want to take it from there, but that's kind of, that's kind of where it began for me. In the beginning, there was heaven and there was earth. Our creator blessed us with an abundance of life here on Turtle Island to live with the animals, to respect them, to protect them, protect our land, protect our waters, protect our life ways, to be strong, to be thankful, to be courageous, to be proud. Proud of our history. Proud of our culture. We gather to dance. We gather to sing. We gather to thank our Creator for this abundance of life. We are indigenous. We are Quapa. Yeah, I'd be curious, Chris, why don't you paint the picture of what was the task, like what's actually physically happening, and then let's start diving through it. Like both of you came into my office and were like, hey, we've got a, we've got a fun uh, project for you. And I'm like, this is great, because I've only ever done, there's different types of 3D work. You have like the generalist, who knows like a little bit of everything. It's like the shotgun approach. Then you have like a modeler, the lighting guy, a composition person, like all these different elements to create something that you see at the, at the end of the day. And I kind of approached it as I'm gonna be a generalist. I need to know a little bit of everything. And before that, I had done 3D work in only like hard surface modeling, they call it, like um, machines and like a, mar a microphone's hard surface. And there's nothing organic about the microphone. It's all hard surfaces, metals flooring, a table, that sort of stuff. So when Jason's coming to me saying, we need eagles and buffalo and an otter swimming in the water, it's like, oh, okay, yeah, sure, I'll do that. Sure, <laughs> boss, I could do whatever you did. So I was kind of nervous in the Mesa when it came to that, but I was excited because it meant that I was gonna learn a lot more than I had known at the time. And um, kind of the whole takeaway from that was me, it was definitely biting off way more than I could chew and time management. Because if you go back and look, I think I, we spent, I spent like a month on the Buffalo shot and it turned out like amazing. But looking back at it, I could have been like, oh, I could have tweaked that or I could have made that a little bit better. For the other shots, um, just, you know, expanding that. But again, with anything, it's the balance of time, how good you want it to be, render times, all that stuff. So uh, yeah, but when you first approached me, I was nervous, but hopeful. When you start making decisions on, so so eventually, right, we sort through it. Okay, we're going to do it. Chris is good enough. Tackett says, why not? No, but I wasn't. Well, you said, I'm willing. Mm. You might have not been good enough, mm. but you were willing. Okay, hey, That's just like us and God. It is. You just have to be willing. <laughs> all right, so Chris is willing. Tackett's going to take a leap of faith. Same here. I'm just like, all right, let's see what happens. Yeah. How do you then decide which software am I going to use? and then start talking us through what were the next steps because I feel like it was sort of scene by scene. I don't know if you chose multiple softwares or if you, I don't even know what you did. So why don't you take us from there? <clears throat> yeah, that was still in the early days of trying to figure out, hey, 3D animation, it's easy. Look at this explosion in my hand. <laughs> you know, stuff like that. Um, <laughs> I get it, that's no, good. No, okay. That's good, keep going. Okay. Um, when it came to 3D stuff, I we, we it was like, hey, we want to do this all inside the computer. What does that look like? So I I took um, a page from the greats and I storyboarded it out. I went and grabbed a coffee. I left the office. I, I grabbed a notebook and I just kind of wrote out, here's scene one, two, three, four, five, all these different animals we're going to be looking at. And then it ends up at the casino with like this giant... Uh, performance what is it called concert yeah the giant concert yeah. happening at the end so i kind of like before i even got on the computer i was using pen and paper 
Mm -hmm. So that'd be my first program. And then uh, we had already kind of decided between either Blender or Cinema 4D, and I'd really hopped into Cinema 4D, and I liked the way certain things were made and certain things were done in Cinema 4D. I used to be a Blender boy, but uh, the name of the software is Blender. It's free to use. It's open source. You can go right now and download it. Uh, Blender, and a lot of people use it. It's kind of like a catch-all. They have like 2D um, animation capabilities. They have sculpting, lighting. It's all there in in that program. But Cinema 4D is a little bit more on the the 3D like modeling side. Uh, not necessarily like ZBrush, although they are paired with Maxon now. This is like super nerdy. Do you really want me to get into all this stuff? This is a nerdy. Um episode yeah okay great. we'll put a disclaimer at the i'm beginning. just assuming yeah. people knows what know what maxon is i do i see it on my credit card statement all yeah, the time yeah that's that's me <laughs> thanks for that i appreciate that yep. you've helped me become a smarter person great wonderful okay but yeah in saying all of that there's probably a, a like three or four different methods until we got until the final um product that you see but in cinema 40 you could have like the native renderer which is decent, but we use a program called uh, Octane, which is a third-party plugin that we link to Cinema 4D. So when we want to have a light or something in the scene, it's it uses real-world values. So if the light was like 10 inches by 7 inches, like dimensions, and I stuck it in a scene, and I had like a person in there, however far or however big that light is shining on that person, it more or less getting pretty close to real world, like bouncing off a, a skin or bouncing off of a surface. So that, I mean, light is how we see like the 3D world. Mm -hmm. So you, if you gotta have the lighting correct, and this is like my first time doing again, like organic, like turtles and otters and buffalo. So I have this uh, HDRI as they call it, high dynamic range institution. I don't, I don't know don't remember either. I don't remember, but it's called an HDR. High High dynamic range image, which basically, uh, when you turn up and down the power of this image, um, it basically emits light from the bright spots and then like the shadows, there's no em emission from that. Mm -hmm. So I grabbed like an HDRI of a field. The first scene I did, actually the first scene I did wasn't the buffalo, it was officially the deer. And they cut the deer. Right. So mm -hmm. I had worked a week or two on getting One this, of the like, cooler shots, too. Yeah, I yeah. thought it was pretty cool. Like, this, we bought a deer model. Because I'm not going to spend hours modeling and figuring out how antlers work. and Days. Yeah, and that's basically learning yeah. a, autonomy in where muscles go and bone structure of these animals. It's not worth it. Anatomy. Yeah, anatomy of these animals. Uh, but instead of doing that, we just got a couple online. Learned how to do rigging. That's the first time I ever rigged something, which is basically... Um, you're moving bones inside of a 3D model to give it animation and mesh. Mm -hmm. So having a, a deer look up and over and then running off was like the first thing I had ever I had ever um, rigged. Because prior to that, again, I was working with AC units and climate control units and things <laughs> that just sat there. Right. I don't have to animate. Maybe a swinging door open. Okay, a 90 degree. Make right. sure the um, the angle point or whatever. And it's the, the hardest thing point. to emulate because we know yes. what these things look like especially right. these these all these animals are more common people like, have we seen know them all. Yeah. what it looks like what it moves that's like. how an eagle should fly <laughs> and you know the other thing that was we kind of figured out is that we can there's certain things we can purchase that speed up the workflow like you were saying like yeah. we purchased all the animals and not only that but some of them had built-in animation like the eagle had a, a flapping animation and so that saved us a little bit of time but still it didn't do all the things we needed to do, so we had to take that and enhance it, and we had to find the environment for it, build the environment. We even found a plugin that basically it's called Forester, and it generates um, trees or, yeah. mm. and and uh, foliage across different environments. So you have like a plane, you can generate this type of tree and this type of tree across the thing, mm -hmm. and instead of like going and hand placing trees, I was know? basically so, painting. Yeah. on my ground layer of like this red brush and it was like populating trees and like automatically like scattering them randomly all over where the buffalo were running. And Same thing with like grass and all. all it's kind of, kind of the stuff. similar thing with like, uh, you know, you're testing the limits of the computer, but how much detail do you place and where do you place it? Because you can put a bunch of detail, but then the computer doesn't even move a second. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you figure out, okay, if we put the detail here and then as the camera goes farther back, 
a little less detail, and it's then back here, it's just an image, yeah. Yeah. just the background. And where does that trick the eye enough to where your computer can actually physically handle it and render it and not yeah. take you know, an hour per frame, which it, it was at different points. So it was like a lot of experimentation, you know, fighting with the computer, like, okay, if I put this in, is it gonna explode? And we, we were we were making <laughs> I've jokes, had multiple like, crashes, yeah. Yeah, you would just you would change one number and then mm -hmm. the computer would just shut off. Like literally just just it's done. And so I, yeah, I remember <laughs> that because you're like, oh there's there's a lot of grass. Let's and you like changed I added a zero. Of, yeah, you added one zero, <laughs> which was like, you know, ten thousand is now like a hundred like thousand. So yeah. it's like, okay, the computer just shut off. So it was a lot of you know, a lot of experimentation and then I think what we ended up doing is we ended up going with the cuts, cut scenes instead of the you know one animation. Right. Part of the reason we did that is so that I could take on a couple of scenes because we were running out of time. Right, and we're so kind of separate. I think I took on like you two took the scenes last, maybe. The last half, the crowd scenes is what you Yeah, did. so I was able to do that because we knew where these camera cuts were going to be. And I, I think another thing we kind of skipped over was after you had your storyboard made, we made these very crude, what they call in like the film business is pre mm -hmm. which yeah. is like very crude looking it's the scene everything's there but it might be like just very lo-fi it's yeah. a it's a view it's like the viewport render right with, it's just the primitive object not ne necessarily even the mesh no material no lighting right. yeah no like texture or anything on it and it's so just the we basic. were able to take that make all the scenes just really quickly basic like that still it took some time because you had to put everything there and kind of decide where the camera is going to go turn that into the edit and then I was able to work on the edit a little bit, add some sound effects, music, mm -hmm. while he was still working on the scenes. And then as soon as I got the edit in a good spot, then I was able to tell him, hey, you only need to render from here to here. Mm -hmm. You know, don't, because I mean, we're talking, I don't know where we ended up, but you know, per frame it was, I think, five, 10 minutes. I don't remember where we yeah. landed, but you Towards know, when you're working end, we had to scale it five down to 10 minutes a frame, we're running out of time. And yeah. you're talking 24 frames a second and you're talking, 60 to 90 seconds, Yeah, that's gonna take a long time. So if we can save like from rendering this part and this part and we only need from here to here, it's it's worth it. You know, so all that pre-planning kind of helps out. Yeah. Just to pull back out of nerd world for a moment and tell the audience what it is we're even talking about. So we start with, uh, what's the first animal? Basically, Chris is- The turtle. Yeah, and it really was really close to what your initial storyboard was, but it starts on the, it starts, on a you're on like a mountain, mountainous scene, Kay. and you're zooming out, and as you pull out, you realize that you're not on a mountain, because you, you see all the trees, and, yep. the, and it, you pull through, and you realize it's the back of a turtle, Okay. and in the stories that they tell, that is actually, it goes with the story, because the turtle carried the world on its back, so that's why we kind of did that shot. Yep. So as you pull out the turtle, you're now, he's sitting on a rock in a stream, like a river stream, and you pull out past that and you see like an otter that hops into the water. I can't remember what the otter does, but then the camera goes down into the water. A bunch of fish swim past it. I think a snake maybe. Yeah, some trout. You go up out of the water. And is that where we cut to the eagle, I believe? The eagles. Yep. Then we're flying with an eagle. And then uh, the eagle's flying over some buffalo. You can see it, the mm -hmm. buffalo below it. Cut to the buffalo. We're running with the buffalo, really cool slow motion shot. Mm -hmm. And um, what happens after that? Does it go straight to the- No, it pops up into the buffalo, doesn't it? Yeah, after the buffalo. I think it goes to the, tri to the tribe dance. It goes inside of the eagle's eye. Oh, right, okay, so then it goes- To the tribe. Oh, so I got re I reversed them. So it's the buffalo, then the eagle. Yeah. So after the eagle, it goes into the eagle's eye, and then you come out into this uh, tribal dance yep. scene where which is actually the based on, we actually use reference videos of uh, an event that they have where there's a dance and there's people mm -hmm. surrounding on bleachers. So we made that kind of like as close to that reference as we could. And then it cuts from that in the background and you see the concert. Mm -hmm. And so we made, and this is one of the more fun scenes that I got to work on. Um, it was, I don't know how many people we put in there, but it, we did a crowd simulation of, you know, 10, 20,000 people. cheering people. and yeah, so yeah. it ends on that scene right above that. There's a logo. And the and the downstream casinos way off in the yeah, background. Right in the back. Was so, that was that animated or was that footage? Uh no, everything was animated. Yeah. I I modeled out like a crude version of downstream. Yeah. And I just threw it in the back. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. so I think I think you're right. I think I worked nice. on everything from after the eagle. Yeah. On. So yeah. So basically So I had all the animals, you had all the people. Right. 
So, which is the hardest thing to do in the, animation? For the people, we were able to find models that there's a website called uh, Mixamo where you can take like a, a model of a person, any different person or biped, it could be an alien or whatever, but anyway, any person and you can add certain animations and they have all mm -hmm. these pre pre made animations that people have done mocaps to. And what's um, mocap? It's where you uh, basically put on a suit and capture animation. Motion capture. Yeah. So anyway, uh, we found a, a really cool dancing one, a couple different variations, added that to the models, and then we instanced them out into the circle. So you had your dance. And then we also added like people like, you know, doing that and clapping and stuff like that. And then onto the concert scene, it was the same idea. We had to find lower res models because I had to make, you know, 20,000 or whatever. We wanted mm -hmm. to make it look like epic concert. And same thing, I think I did like four or five different animations, that way it looked random. Yeah. And then as you're flying through, then we took all the lights out and just had the concert lights. So it was really cool, fun, like, it was just an interesting thing. I've always wanted to make a crowd simulation ever since I saw um, kind of the behind the scenes of Lord of the Rings. That, that was like the first ever yeah. where they simulated like 100,000 orcs charging Fighting. towards a castle. So I was like, I gotta do this. and. You know, yeah, it's cool getting, yeah. Uh, last little section that I'd like to cover on this animation. I'd like to talk a little bit. Obviously, there's a lot of rigging. There's a lot of, um, you know, cameras, all that stuff. But then it, but then one of the, and I don't know if it's a final step, but one of the high, highly detailed steps is all the textures and the lighting that, that you then go put on it to make it yeah. photorealistic. Um, where, where I'm curious, like just from a, a brief order, like what, what is the basic order that you do it in? Is it like find the element, stick it there, put a skin on it? How does it all work? Yeah, that's what Tackett was alluding to earlier. The, and I guess other people like workflows are different for each person, depending on what, like the artist is feeling what they're, what they're comfortable with. But I know like the basic model before you do any texturing or lighting, Models and animation is the number one. Mm -hmm. And luckily for us, when we bought a, a lot of our models, they come in with like baked shading and animation. Yeah. The buffalo fur, I did spend a long time because when the buffalo's running, the fur is kind of like moving with it. And if you kind of like go frame by frame, you'll see like the buffalo. Yeah, the dynamics. And luckily, I didn't have to like figure all of that out. But um, we bought that model without it using octane mm -hmm. hair simulation and so there's like this weird dynamic where i spent like a week converting it yeah right? converting that and also the eagle was flying upside down yeah. like when i converted it over to cinema 40 because they used a different program they used like mm. maxon or not maxon um, the, what he did to the eagle to get it to work like i would have given up when I saw, <laughs> when I walked in, when I, he, you first pulled it in. <laughs> His and, neck was I all mean, twisted around. Have, and... <laughs> I w we could maybe pull it in a screenshot or something if you can find it. But like, if you could pull in the original Eagle, it's just this mangled mess. <laughs> and you're like, I don't know what's make. I don't know what's Yeah, which this. part is the bird? <laughs> yeah, like what's, why it's doing this. Yeah. But you somehow figured it out. How did you figure it out? Tutorials, man. <laughs> <laughs> I, I learned how to like basically rig from the ground up when you have like a base mesh with no with no um, skeleton. So there's like this inside skeleton that was flapping its wings, but loading the eagle mesh on top of it for whatever reason would like flip around and get it distorted. And it was like doing this thing. <laughs> I remember when I did get it though, Jason at one point walked in and he was like, yeah, that's an eagle. No, no that's a bald eagle. Cause I know what their wingspan is. And that's, I'm like, okay, Mr. Outdoorsy over here with his bald <laughs> well, you, eagle you, knowledge. Like I've been out in the wilderness. I didn't, Chris, I, go I touch grass. I Chris, I that. No, you did. It's a it's a it's a core memory. All right. Well, progress. Did I answer so, your question? Wait, maybe. What did you say? Maybe. Um, no, I was just trying to find like the what's order at which. Yes. Order okay. So yeah. Let me. Maybe I'll that. ask Tackett. Tackett, what's the order? <laughs> I'll I'll do it really fast. So okay. Uh, that previs thing I was saying, where you basically find all the elements, put them in the scene. Yep. Even before we bought the models, we would just find like free ones, like a free deer yep. model that's just looks the crappy. The low poly. But. We put it in the scene. Okay, we like that, and put the camera in. Yep. And the reason we do that is because, depending on where the camera is, if the camera's going here, you don't need all this stuff, and you, yeah. don't need to, you don't need to spend time on that. And 
when you get into that point, you don't want to waste time on half of a scene. That yeah, you're not stuff that's see. behind it's the camera. It's kind of like a set, you know. Yeah, painting you can have a boulder a and a set. worrying about <clears throat> like something that's going to be behind the camera. And I kept telling you, I was like, "Hey, where's the camera going to be?" And I, I kept coming in and like, I love that you that know, you did that. Yeah. So after that, after you got the camera, you basically go into you know getting the right models mm -hmm. that are going to be like your photo quality models. And then you start adding lights. So you already have the animation, or maybe that would be the animation would be next if you need to do animation. Then you start adding lights, and then textures and lighting probably kind of go hand in hand. I would say texture is probably first, but you're going to have to have the lights in there to see if the texture is looking right. Yeah. And then after that, rendering is actually another step. Rendering is like, it's not rendering right. It's too bright. You yeah. Know, light, rendering in 3D is like, part of the lighting process in a weird yeah. way. Like you can have the lights all set up, but then when you hit render, everything's too bright or everything's too dark or you're getting noise, or, you know what I mean? So. And to mention the unsung hero of this project was Adam V. Hill, because he did an awesome job coming back through and like adding noise and like realistic grain mm -hmm. and chromatic aberration, which is like the little jitter that you have of the red and the blue that are separated by like, you know, millimeters yeah. on screen but it's there and it, it, it like kind of sells it just a little bit more to make it look that basically much more realistic. after we rendered out the image sequences from c4d we took them into after effects turned them into a video you did a little bit in there i think in after effects on certain shots um there was a couple shots where you kind of enhanced it and then we sent it to adam to do davinci resolve and what you're saying is true i mean we talked about it like there's certain things that you could do it in in the 3d software and bake it into your render but you're waiting five minutes a frame and you realize you hate it and, and it looks terrible. Yeah. yeah. Or you go into resolve and you're like, cool, aberration. Oh, too much. Oh, pull it back. Yeah, you can oh, tweak blur it. it a little bit. You know, he even did some fake depth of field where he would like blur like the sides and kind of, um, that's right. You yeah, know, he did do that. just leave the center in focus and like, because it renders faster it just, if, if everything's it looks in cool. focus. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. It, it looks cool and it just adds like that layer. It sells it a little bit more than when you're looking at like if you stripped off the color and you just looked at our base render you'd be a little bit less convinced. For sure. You know? so. yeah, yeah. yeah, well, we are out of time, so I'm going to conclude us up on this one. Um, I feel like in the end, the uh, you know, it was, a, it was a very awesome project. They were very excited. I think all of us were really proud of it, too. I mean, there's different elements of it. Like, I still think the buffalo. I love the buffalo. Love the buffalo. Because I like the particles and the dirt and the dust and Again, the slow-mo. Yeah, yeah, and that wasn't time even... On. But the, yeah. exactly, you can tell it's like, oh, it was, spent it, was some time it was really, really good. I'm an award winning VFX artist because the downstream spot won an award. You're right, you're right. Wow, it is true. Award winning. I'm an so. award, I'm an award winning to, to be determined what, what award I'm well, excited. That's not, it doesn't, we'll know, don't say the award. <laughs> we'll, we'll know by the time this is over. <laughs> Well, we appreciate you guys uh, tuning in, watching our podcast here, Retrospect from the Archives. Uh, if you're interested to find more, we have lots of episodes on all kinds of projects that we dissect. Uh, you can go to our website, retrospectfilms.com, and uh, hopefully we will see you next time on our next episode right here. See you guys. Bye. Later. Bye. <laughs> Was that not? Bye. Bye.